Welcome to the colorectal virtual education series bonus episode. Due to the increased resident presence on our weekly series, this year we will be doing an app site review on the topics we love and know best, colon, rectal, and anal pathology. I'm Lauren Weaver, one of the series education fellows. And I'm Connie Gann, a general surgery resident and the other series education fellow. So if you did not review the 30 plus score modules dedicated to colorectal anal topics this year, don't worry, we've got you covered. This episode is designed for active learning. So go ahead and print out the review PDF attached to the video. Grab your colored pens, pencils, or markers and follow along with us. After the video, use the completed review PDF for your future studying. You could also print out a blank PDF and try to fill it out from memory and cross check it with the completed review. That way you focus your app site studying on what you don't know and don't waste time on topics you already mastered. Okay, everyone, let's get started with our benign disease episode. Connie, can you start us out with some basic anatomy? What is the arterial blood supply to the colon? So the superior mesenteric artery or the SMA gives off three branches. One of these is the iliocolic artery, which is the terminal branch of the SMA. The second is the right colic artery. And the third is the middle colic artery. These arteries supply the ascending colon to the proximal two thirds of the transverse colon. The second main artery is the inferior mesenteric artery, or IMA, which gives off the left colic artery, which supplies the distal one-third of the transverse colon and descending colon. The IMA also gives off sigmoid arteries, which supply the sigmoid colon. And then the last branch of the IMA is the superior rectal artery, which we will talk about in detail when we talk about the arterial supply to the rectum. Great. And why is it important to know the arterial blood supply to the colon? So it's important when planning a partial colectomy because which section and how much of the colon is taken follows the blood supply. So for example, if you have a colon tumor in the middle of the ascending colon, you cannot just resect the section right where the tumor is. You would need to perform a complete right colectomy since you're taking the right colic artery. And then what is the venous drainage of the colon? So the names of the veins are actually really similar to the artery. So it's it's easy to remember. So the iliocolic, right colic, and middle colic veins drain into the superior mesenteric vein or the SMV. which then empties into the portal circulation. And similarly, the left colic and sigmoid veins drain into the inferior mesenteric vein or the IMV, which empties into the portal circulation as well. This is why metastatic colon cancer often goes to the liver first. Okay, now moving on to the rectum, what is the arterial supply to the rectum? So I like to think about the arterial supply to the rectum in three portions. So the superior rectal, which is a branch off the IMA, supplies the proximal rectum, 
the middle rectal artery is a branch off the internal iliac artery and the internal pudendal artery, which supplies the middle rectum. And the inferior rectal artery is a branch of the internal pudendal artery, which supplies the inferior rectum. Awesome. Now, what about the venous drainage of the rectum? In the superior areas, the superior rectal vein drains into the IMV. which then drains into the portal circulation. And then for the middle and inferior areas, those rectal veins drain to the internal iliac vein and then into the systemic circulation. Okay, and why is it important to know the venous drainage of the rectum? Well, it's important because it gives you clues about where the metastases will be. So with lower rectal cancers, these will most likely go to the groin lymph nodes. Awesome. Yeah, that's why we palpate the groin on physical exam in those cases. Are there any named collateral arteries we should know about? Yes, the marginal artery. And the arc of Riolan. connect the IMA and SMA blood supplies. And next, what are the watershed regions of the colon? So watershed regions are where two major blood supplies connect, and these are areas of the colon that are most prone to ischemia. There are two main watershed regions in the colorectal area. So the first one is Griffiths Point at the splenic flexure. This is where the middle colic artery from the SMA and the left colic artery from the IMA overlap. The second is Sudex point, which is located where the superior and middle rectum meet. This is where the superior rectal artery from the IMA overlaps with the middle rectal artery from the internal pudendal artery. All right, next question. What parts of the colon are retroperitoneal? 
the ascending and descending portions of the colon, but not the transverse. This next question is a question I get all the time in the operating room, but how do you anatomically define the proximal rectum? It's the tinea splay. This starts at the sacral promontory near S3. and then the loss of epiploic appendages. As colorectal surgeons, we're always looking for the ureter. So what are your landmarks for finding the ureter? The ureter courses uh, posterior to gonadal vessels and anterior to the common iliacs. All right, next we'll switch over to inflammatory bowel disease. First, we'll be discussing Crohn's disease. So Lauren, what are the features of Crohn's disease bowel? So I like to think about this in a few different parts. So when you look at the bowel on the outside, the Crohn's disease usually has skip lesions, and that's scattered portions of disease bowel. Another thing you see is creeping fat. So you will see fat starting to surround the disease bowel. What you see inside the bowel is commonly tested linear ulcerations, which are deep ulcers on the mucosal surface. And also cobblestone of the mucosa. And then under the microscope, histologically, you can see non-caseating granulomas and Langerhans giant cells. And great. What's the most common location of Crohn's disease? That would be the terminal ileum. And uh, what is the typical age distribution of patients with Crohn's disease? It's usually bimodal, so young patients, 15 to 25 years old, and then older patients, usually 55 to 65 years old. Crohn's is a pretty tricky disease, but if a patient has a, a stricture due to Crohn's disease, what can you order to help decide management going forward? You want to decide if the patient is having a stricture due to active or chronic inflammation, so you can order an MRI or CT enterography. That way you can differentiate between the active and chronic inflammation. If you see a stricture with active inflammation, there is a chance it can improve with medicine, 
While if you see a stricture with chronic inflammation, you will likely need dilation or surgery for that patient. What is the first line treatment for Crohn's disease? The first line treatment is medicine. So for flares, you start the patient on IV steroids while they're admitted to the hospital. For maintenance, you can use aminosalicates like sulfasalazine or mesalamine. You can also use immunosuppressive medication like azathioprine. Six mercaptopurine or methotrexate. If a patient has severe disease, chronic therapy could be biologics, particularly TNF-alpha inhibitors like infliximab or novel agents. And when should you offer surgery for Crohn's disease? There are a number of surgical indications for Crohn's disease. One is if medical therapy fails That includes you're taking medicine and your symptoms don't get better, or you are on chronic steroid use, which is not sustainable or healthy for the patient. Other surgical indications include obstruction, cancer, a chronic stricture, an abscess, severe perianal disease, fistula, or a bowel perforation. And speaking of strictures, what are the different options for management of strictures? The surgical management depends on size. A stricture less than five centimeters that you can get to endoscopically, you can go ahead and try dilating the stricture. If you also have a small stricture, which is seven centimeters or less, you can perform the, the Heineke Mikulix. For medium-sized strictures, you can perform the Finney Strictureplasty, which is for 10 to 15 centimeter size stricture. And then for large strictures over 15 centimeters to preserve bowel, you'll do the Michalassi. Just to remember what strictures these are, the Heineke Michalix, you make an incision along the stricture and then sew it transversely. So I like to think of it like you are folding a piece of paper, either hot dog or hamburger style. And I like to imagine the bowel stricture is a hot dog and you cut along the hot dog, then sew it together hamburger style. And then for the Finney procedure, um, it's like a closed pin uh, with the strictured bowel that you suture in the middle to make a joint channel. And then lastly, the McLassey, um, you divide the crone strictured bowel in half then slice open the bowel wall along the strictures and suture the ends together and the bowel, bowel wall sides. So I like to think of this more conceptually. Um, I think of it 
if you were to clasp your hands in front of you and then break them apart to simulate cutting the strictured ball in half, and then you fold your arms uh, genie style, and that's what the stricture plasty is going to look like after a McLassy. I uh, highly recommend that you look up what these strictures look like, and then you'll get a better idea of it. Thank you for your description of how to conceptualize and think about all of these different structural plasties. But I guess the next question is, when do you offer a structural plasty? So you will only offer this when everything is in ideal circumstance. So it'll be an elective setting to a well-nourished patient. And before you offer it, what's super important to do beforehand? You want to make sure you're not leaving a cancer behind, so you always biopsy the stricture. And when performing a segmental resection, if you really have to uh, for Crohn's patients, do you remove all the disease bowel or just what is actively inflamed? Do not remove all the chronically diseased bowel. You only remove what is actively inflamed. And what happens if there is an abscess in the setting of Crohn's disease? The patient should undergo a percutaneous drainage and then a segmental resection about four to six weeks afterwards because there's a 30% chance that this will recur. And I imagine that you want some of that inflammation to improve before you, you go and do surgery as well. And so the next section we have is ulcerative colitis. All right, Connie, for ulcerative colitis, what extra intestinal symptoms will not improve with a total colectomy? So these are the symptoms that aren't really directly associated with the colon. So it's the ankylosing spondylitis. and PSC, and there is a 50% chance that pyoderma improves. All right, great. And what are the features of a diseased bowel in ulcerative colitis? So on microscopy, the things that you would see are crypt abs abscesses. Panath cell metaplasia. Basal lymphoid aggregates. As well as lamina propria eosinophils. For ulcerative colitis, what are the indications for surgery? There are three main indications for surgery. So the first is if a patient is very sick. So this could be a patient with a perforation, progressive GI sepsis, toxic megacolon, or a GI bleed. So for the second indication for surgery, this is for failed medical management. So this will manifest as malnutrition or growth delay for kids. And then the third main category is high-grade dysplasia or cancer.
Great. What are the surgical options for ulcerative colitis? Well, this would depend if you're doing an emergency surgery for those patients that are sick or an elective surgery. So in the emergency situation, this would be a total abdominal colectomy with an end ileostomy. A discussion about whether a pouch would be used in the next stages of surgery would be held after the, the initial surgery and then once the patient had healed and is healthy from that emergency initial surgery. For elective situations, this would also be a total abdominal colectomy with an end ileostomy or total proctocolectomy. And this would be uh, plus or minus the iliopouch anal anastomosis. What is the management for pouchitis? So for first line, this would be with antibiotics, which is usually Cipro and Flagyl. The second line would be with steroids or mesalamine enemas. And what are the absolute contraindications for a pouch after total abdominal colectomy? If a patient already has severe baseline fecal incontinence, the pouch probably would not be an option. as well as if there's a rectal cancer involving the sphincters. And then lastly would be also diagnosis of Crohn's. Pouch for Crohn's disease is highly debated, but on the app site, I would not recommend giving a Crohn's patient a pouch. Since these inflammatory bowel patients are often on steroids at home, how do you manage them when they're about to go through a procedure? I think it depends on the severity or type of procedure that they're going through. So if they're going through a minor procedure, um, then you would continue their home steroid. They don't require any stress dosing. And then they would just continue that steroid post-op as well. For moderate procedures, they would also continue their home steroid, but they would require some stress dose steroids on top and then a taper afterwards. So the stress dose would be 50 milligrams of IV hydrocortisone, and then usually post-op, then you would do 25 milligrams of IV hydrocortisone every eight hours for 24 hours. And then if the patient is undergoing a major surgery, they would not only continue their home steroid, but they would have a higher stress dose steroid as well as a longer taper. So the stress dose would be 100 milligrams IV hydrocortisone, and then the taper would be 50 milligrams IV um, every eight hours for 24 hours of also hydrocortisone. Next topic will be diverticulitis. Great. So diverticulitis is something that we see commonly day to day at the hospital. So Lauren, how would you classify diverticulitis? So that's based on the Hinchy classification And there are four levels. Hinchy class one is a pericolic or mesenteric abscess less than four centimeters. Hinchy classification two is a walled off distant abscess or greater than four centimeter abscess. Hinchy classification three is purulent peritonitis. And then Hinchy four is feculent peritonitis.
how would you manage diverticulitis? It depends on the patient's symptoms and imaging findings. So if a patient has an uncomplicated diverticulitis with mild symptoms and can tolerate oral intake, it's okay to send them home with outpatient antibiotics. If the patient is unable to tolerate oral intake or they have a small abscess, less than three centimeters, or a micro perforation, then that patient would be admitted NPO, IV fluids, and then started on IV antibiotics, usually Zosin or Ceftraxone flagell. If the patient has a large abscess on imaging over five centimeters, IR would be consulted to place an abscess drain. And again, the patient would be NPO and we would start IV antibiotics. Now, if the patient fails medical management their abscess is unable to be drained and cannot resolve with antibiotics alone or is experiencing purulent peritonitis, we would take that patient to the operating room. And my first choice or safe answer on the ab site would be a Hartman's, which is a sigmoid colectomy and an end colostomy. Or, and this is debated, you can do a sigmoid colectomy with or without a diverting loop ileostomy. However, the patient is in septic shock or has feculent peritonitis, then I would go ahead and answer a Hartman's on the ab site. Great. And what are the features of complicated diverticulitis? I think of complicated diverticulitis as anything other than diverticular infl inflammation. So if you see free air on imaging, the patient has an abscess, a fistula, bowel obstruction, peritonitis, or hypotension, those are all considered complicated diverticulitis. And in complicated diverticulitis, what size uh, abscess seen on imaging should you be thinking about? I need to get and call IR for this to be drained. It depends on institution, but normally you would call IR for an abscess over three to five centimeters. And when should you refer a patient for elective sigmoidectomy after a first uncomplicated diverticulitis episode? So after a first uncomplicated episode, I would not refer them for an elective sigmoidectomy unless the patient is immunocompromised. The first episode is usually the worst episode, and patients may never have another episode again. And who should be offered an elective sigmoidectomy if it isn't after the first episode? So the recommendations are based on the individual, but usually you would recommend a patient undergo a sigmoidectomy if they have chronic diverticulitis with pain or if they have complicated diverticulitis that has resolved or if the patient is immunocompromised with any prior episode of diverticulitis. And what's an important procedure to do prior to elective sigmoidectomy? You should always do a complete colonoscopy to rule out a malignancy. And it seems like the gold standard for a sigmoidectomy is through a minimally invasive approach. Why is that the preferred approach? Yeah, these type of questions are getting more common on the ab site. MIS is now the gold standard for a sigmoidectomy. 
because it has a lower surgical site infection rate, decreased length of stay, less intraoperative blood loss, decreased postoperative pain, and patients have a faster return of bowel function. The only thing is that minimally invasive surgery takes longer and there are no significant long-term differences between minimally invasive and open surgery. Great, and that concludes diverticulitis. Our next section is about colonic pseudo-obstruction, otherwise called Ogilvy's. All right, Connie, what are the greatest risks of perforation with colonic pseudo-obstruction? The first thing is the size. So if the cecum is more than 12 centimeters, or if it's more than 10 centimeters for three to four days, Next is if it, the colon has been distended for more than six days. Third is if there's no improvement after 48 hours. So both a combination of the size of distension as well as uh, length. All right, and what is the progression of colonic pseudo-obstruction management? Yeah, so the first line is generally trying to correct things that might have caused the pseudo-obstruction in the first place. So that usually involves bowel rests and NPO status, an NG tube for decompression, electrolyte correction, as well as avoiding lactulose, opioids, anticholinergics, um, and calcium channel blockers, usually as well as um, other types of uh, bowel regimen. If this doesn't work, then the next step up would be either endoscopic decompression, so a procedure, or with medicine, which would be through neostigmine. However, of note, neostigmine can cause severe bradycardia that might require atropine, so might not be the best option for patients with a heart history. And if both of these fail, then the next step would be a colectomy. Okay, and our next topic will be C. diff colitis. So what is C. diff colitis? C. diff colitis is a pseudomembrane colitis from a toxin-producing anaerobic spore-forming gram-positive bacilli. And which of the toxins of C. diff is more cytotoxic? Toxin B is 10 times more cytotoxic than toxin A. That's really impressive. And what is the strongest risk factor for patients to get C. diff colitis? Usually these patients have had antibiotics within two weeks. And if you suspect C. diff, how do you diagnose it? You would order a stool sample assay with a nucleic acid amplification test after the patient has had three or more watery stools in the last 24 hours. And then after treatment, do you then test to make sure that the patient no longer has C. diff? You do not. You do not have to test for a cure. And what is the first line treatment for a patient who is having C. diff for the first time? First line is oral vancomycin 
or fidaxomycin. Great. And I uh, always remember that fidaxomycin is unique because it only absorbs in the colon. And what is the treatment for recurrent C. diff colitis? So you can try fidaxomycin if you haven't tried that already. Or you can do a pulse tapered oral vancomycin regimen. You can also try a fecal transplant. Probably most, <laughs> only at certain um, institutions. That's true. What is the medical treatment for fulament C. diff colitis? These patients should be started on oral vancomycin with IV flagell plus or minus vancomycin enema, depending if they also have an ileus from the C. diff colitis. And you're going to get consulted on these patients because they might need surgery. What are the surgical indications for C. diff colitis? The first one is for fulminant C. diff colitis. So these patients are in shock or they are starting to have signs of organ failure. That is an indication for surgery. Another one is toxic megacolon. So the definition of this is on imaging, their colon is over six centimeters at any part or the cecum is over 12 centimeters. Lastly, an indication for surgery is failure of medical management. Got it. And what is the surgery that you would perform in these cases? You're going to do a total abdominal colectomy with an end ileostomy. And what if the colon looks viable on the outside during surgery? So this is a mucosal disease. So you continue with your total abdominal colectomy, even if the colon looks fine on the outside. The next section is on ischemic colitis. Okay, Connie, what are the classic symptoms of ischemic colitis? Crampy abdominal pain and bloody diarrhea. And what is the cause of this? Usually it's secondary to a low flow state. So this could be to severe dehydration or hypovolemia. I've seen this most commonly in heart failure. And it can also be after severe vascular disease. So maybe after a AAA uh, repair and they don't have great blood flow to the colon. So if you're concerned about ischemic colitis, what's your diagnostic test of choice? If the patient is relatively stable, I would usually do a colonoscopy to look at the watershed areas. And how would you treat these patients? Well, first line is definitely supportive care. So you would give them bowel rest, IV fluids, and antibiotics, um, and then try to also correct the underlying cause of their low flow state. And then if they're able to correct that low flow state, then usually the ischemic colitis can resolve in, in one to two weeks. And when is surgery indicated for ischemic colitis? Yeah, so surgery is indicated if the ischemia spreads from just the mucosa to become full thickness or if the patient's clinically deteriorating. So if they're becoming sick with unstable vitals or if their abdominal exam really worsens. All right, excellent. Our next topic will be volvulus. Yeah, so 
Lauren, there's two types of ovulus. There's sigmoid and sequovolvulus. What are the treatments for each? Let's start with sigmoid volvulus. So on imaging, the patient's colon is said to be coffee bean shaped, in which the sigmoid colon will be dilated and pointing to the right upper quadrant. The treatment for this is initially endoscopic decompression. And if that is successful, the patient will undergo a same admission sigmoidectomy. However, if the patient is toxic appearing or there is ischemia on endoscopy, then the patient will proceed for an emergent sigmoidectomy and will likely get a Hartman's. Then for sequel volvulus, on imaging, these patients usually have a dilated colon that's oriented to the left upper quadrant. People say this looks like a bent inner tube, and the treatment for these patients is a surgical resection. The abscite will try to trick you and say to pexing of the cecum, but that is not correct. The patient needs a surgical resection. Next up is a bunch of topics on benign anorectal disease. First up, we have hemorrhoids. So, Connie, how do you differentiate between the two types of hemorrhoids? And what are the two types of hemorrhoids? So, the two types are internal and external hemorrhoids. You would identify internal hemorrhoids because they're above the dentate line, while external are below. Typically, the internal hemorrhoids cause bleeding but no pain, and while external mostly cause pain. All right. And what is the initial treatment for a patient with hemorrhoids? Well, hemorrhoids are mostly from constipation and straining and being on the toilet for too long. The initial treatment includes things like fiber, increasing water intake, other stool softeners, as well as sitz baths. Okay, great. And is there a grading system for internal hemorrhoids? Yeah, so there's a grading system from one to four for internal hemorrhoids. Grade one has no prolapse. Grade two, those internal hemorrhoids prolapse, but they spontaneously reduce. For grade three, they prolapse, but they can be manually reduced. And in grade four, once they're prolapsed, they cannot be manually reduced. All right. And what hemorrhoids should be banded? So you'll want to band internal hemorrhoids that are between grade one or two. And where do you place the band on the hemorrhoid? You'll want to be about two centimeters above the dentate line on the hemorrhoid itself and the redundant mucosa. You don't actually want to band the underlying pile. What is the alternative therapy for patients with high risk of post-band bleeding? Yeah, so for patients that are on anticoagulation or another reason that they would have post-band bleeding, sclerotherapy is recommended. After banding, what is a serious complication you want to look out for? 
pelvic sepsis is something that is definitely feared. Absolutely. Okay, enough of the banding. When should you offer a hemorrhoidectomy? This would typically be for failure of medical management. So they've tried fiber, they've tried water intake, and, and their hemorrhoids have not improved. Another situation may be for grade three or four uh, hemorrhoids that you cannot band. Or if they have complications of hemorrhoids, so things like thrombosis, gangrene, or strangulation. All right, perfect. How do you manage a thrombosed external hemorrhoid? It depends on how long it's been since their pain initially started from the thrombosed external hemorrhoid and whether or not their pain is improving. So if it's been less than 72 hours and their pain's not improving, then you typically offer surgical excision. But if it's been more than 72 hours or their pain is improving, then typically it's just symptom management. Great. And I think the general principle with all these hemorrhoid questions is if the patient is having bleeding and you are not 100% sure that it is from their hemorrhoids, just go ahead and get a colonoscopy. Yeah, I definitely agree. If it's Or if the patient has any warning signs of things like weight loss, definitely want to just be sure to make sure that there's not a second source of bleeding. Definitely. And they'll try to trick you on that on the app site. Next topic we have is anal dysplasia. What typically causes an anal condyloma? Anal condylomas are associated with HPV. And is there a screening process for anal dysplasia? There is. High-risk HPV patients should undergo an exam and screening cytology with an anal pap. This needs to be done before the digital rectal exam because the lube can mess up the anal pap results. That's good to know. And if there's positive cytology during a screening, what's the next step? You're going to want to refer that patient for high resolution anoscopy or HRA so they can get a biopsy and ablation. For patients that do have disease, how do you treat it topically? So there are two different types of topical treatments. They are either patient-applied or provider-applied. The patient-applied topicals include podophylox, sinicatechins, and imiquimod for 16 weeks, and then they'll be reevaluated in the clinic. The provider-applied topicals are podophyllin, acetic acid, and cryotherapy. For patients that need more than topical treatment, so they need a surgical option, what do those look like for anal condylomas? So those patients should be referred for excision and fulguration if they have multiple lesions or if those lesions are over one centimeter. Our next topic is fecal incontinence. All right. So what are the common risk factors for fecal incontinence? There are three common risk factors. The first one is trauma, most often an obstetrics injury during delivery. Prior anal surgery, 
or a neurogenic cause, something like diabetes. Okay, and what is the progression of treatment for fecal incontinence? Yeah, so typically you'd want to start with things that are relatively low risk. So diet modification with increased fiber, stool bulking agents, and or antidiarrheals, depending on their symptoms. If the first line agents don't work, the patients can undergo three different types of tests to help determine the next steps. So the first one would be anal manometry to see what their function and squeeze is like. The next would be endoanal ultrasound to see if they have any defects in their sphincter muscle. And then lastly would be diphography to see if that there's any prolapse or rectocele. During this time, pelvic floor PT may be able to help the patient strengthen different muscles to improve their symptoms. But again, if all these interventions that are relatively low risk don't improve the patient's symptoms, then they would most likely have to move to either a sphinctoplasty. or a sacral nerve stimulator. All right. And sacral nerve stimulator would be for a functional problem. Meanwhile, a sphincteroplasty would help more for a defect that you see on the ultrasound. Next topic is rectal prolapse. What is the mainstay of treatment for rectal prolapse? Okay, this is unusual, but the mainstay first-line treatment for rectal prolapse is surgery. Rectal prolapse will not get better with diet or lifestyle modification. Yeah, that is a little bit different. And so what are the operative treatments for rectal prolapse? So there are two operative treatments for rectal prolapse. One is the perineal approach, and the second is the abdominal approach. Let's start with the perineal approach. The perineal approach is for patients with significant comorbidities that really can't tolerate a big procedure. And there are two types of procedures under the perineal approach. One is the Altmeyer procedure. That is a perineal rectosigmoidectomy. And the second is the DeLorme procedure, which is a sleeve mucosal resection. For the abdominal approach, this is the ideal approach that you would want to offer patients. And this would be a rectopexy, usually with mesh, with or without a resection. Great. And what approach should be used for an incarcerated prolapse? you would use the Altmeyer procedure. When should you avoid the Altmeyer procedure altogether? So you should avoid it if the patient has had a prior rectopexy with resection due to possible rectal devascularization, or if the patient has any prior sigmoid or colon resection, again, for fear of rectal devascularization. And can the Altmeyer procedure be done more than once on the same patient? Yes, you technically can redo the Altmeyer procedure if the anastomosis has also prolapsed. Next section, perianal abscesses. All right. Perianal abscess is an exciting one. Connie, when should you give post-abscess drainage antibiotics? I would want to give antibiotics to patients that are immunosuppressed. So in any sort of way, including even diabetics. Other times I'd want to give antibiotics be if that there's symptoms of a spreading infection, such as cellulitis or even systemic signs of infection. 
what is the drainage procedure by perianal abscess type? And what are the different perianal abscess types can you have? I'll first talk about the different types of perianal abscesses. So the first one is called a simple perianal or ischial anal fossa abscess. And this is typically just at the skin. And then the other types include intersphincteric, so between the sphincter, as well as a supralevator abscess. So that would be above the pelvic floor muscles. With a simple perianal or ischial anal fossa abscess, you would just drain this by making an incision through the skin. For intersphincteric perianal anal abscesses, um, you drain this through the anus or the rectum. For the supralevator abscesses, depending on where the abscess originated, you would want to drain them either intra-abdominally or through transrectal. What is the procedure for a horseshoe abscess? These are probably the biggest and most feared abscesses. The procedure would be a modified Hanley procedure. The goal is to open the deep post-anal space, and then you'd want to make bilateral counter incisions to drain the ischial anal fossa and place cetons. For a simple perianal abscess, where is the best place to make a perianal skin incision? You'll want to make the incision as close to the anvirge as possible for the best drainage. Excellent. And what if you keep seeing recurrent abscesses in a young person? Uh, you should definitely be worried about Crohn's disease uh, for that patient. Next section, we're talking about anal fistulas. So is there a classification system for anal fistulas? There is. It's called the Parks Classification System. It's based on the anatomic location of the fistula. And there are four types. Type 1 is intersphincteric. Type 2 is transphincteric. Type 3 is supra-sphincteric, and then type 4 is extra-sphincteric. So for the management of these fistulas, if the fistula is superficial, is intersphincteric or low transphincteric, you can go ahead and do a primary fistulotomy. Assuming that the fistula does not involve more than 30% of the sphincter complex. Now, if the fistula involves over 30% of the sphincter complex, is high transphincteric or suprasphincteric, or the fistula is from Crohn's disease, or it's a female with an anterior fistula, you should just go ahead and place a seat on. For the abscite, I wouldn't recommend picking cutting seton or a fibrin sealant or a fistula plug to treat fistulas. And what are the surgical treatments for fistulas? So if a patient needs a surgery, surgery treatment of choice is a lift procedure, which is ligation of the intersphincteric fistula tract. And another option, use a endoanal advancement flap. And our next section is on anal fissure. Okay. 
What's the most common fissure location? 90% of the time, it's in the posterior midline. And then what are the causes of atypical fissures? If they're atypical, then they will be on the lateral aspects of the anal canal. So these are usually caused by malignancy, Crohn's disease, HIV, syphilis, or tuberculosis. What are symptoms of anal fissures? Patients describe sharp, burning, tearing pain that is unbearable, especially during bowel movements. Last question, what is the approach for managing an anal fissure? Like many of, of the other colorectal uh, treatments for, for different diseases, it's a stepwise approach. Starting with the most low-risk treatments, these would be things in order to avoid constipation. So increasing fiber and water intake, sitz baths, and topical anesthetics. And usually we would recommend these for about six weeks to see if their symptoms improve. However, if this doesn't work, then the next step would be to try to use topical nitrates or calcium channel blockers. However, of note, topical nitrates can cause headaches. If this also doesn't work, Another treatment option we could offer is a botulinum toxin injection into the anal sphincter to relax the sphincter and allow the area to heal. And if all of these treatments from fiber to topical medications to a Botox injection, if these all don't work, then the next step would be surgery. The two options for surgery are a lateral internal sphincterotomy with the risk factor of incontinence. And the second option would be an anocutaneous flap. This has worse outcomes, but has a less risk of incontinence. Right. So on the exam, they will present a patient with an anal fissure and sometimes say the patient has baseline fecal incontinence. And in that case, you would pick anal cutaneous flap and not the lateral internal sphincterotomy. That wraps up our benign review. Now you can use your completed review PDF for future studying. We also included a blank review PDF if you really want to test yourself. Happy Absite Studying! If you like this episode or have some feedback for us, please leave a comment or fill out our survey. Otherwise, see you next time for the Malignant Review.